Good morning, and we know we have many join us through our website or through other means this morning and in our worship, and we welcome you as you, you join us today. I'm on a second part of a series of A Sovereign God, and this morning it's actually the second Sunday of an omniscient God, a God who knows where we exist and what is going on in our lives. And I got, this morning I was thinking how I might want to change a little bit of my opening, and did you see the Evansville paper today? Do any of you remember what happened 80 years ago? The flood. The flood. You don't remember that, do you? No, no, you don't. <laughs> the flood was 80 years ago in Evansville in 37, the great flood of 37. And it brought such destruction and such uh, um, struggle to this city, this area, but yet I think it was one of those, it seems to be one of those points of emphasis within this community, doesn't it? Something that we remember and something that we got through and something that was accomplished as people that was lost during that time, but, but uh, there was an overcoming that seemed to happen. Um, not really what I want to tell you in this little story as I introduce what's going on here this morning about an omniscient God, but, but I think it was a, an important moment for Evansville. Uh, this little story is one you've likely heard before. Preachers I haven't told it here, but maybe another pastor or somebody else has told this story here. But you remember the story about, uh, if you haven't, then good. Uh, the man, there was a flood coming. And the man heard about it and prayed that God would deliver him from that flood. So the waters began to rise, and he was at his home standing outside as he saw the waters coming. And one of the last vehicles in town drove by his home and, and offered to take him to safety. And he says, no, sir, I'm not going to go. I, I pray to God, and God's going to deliver me from this flood. So he refused the transportation. So the waters began to rise, and soon he found himself on the second level of his home. Waters are rising. A boat comes by, comes up to his window in his home, and yells inside, knowing that this man was there. And he said, and asked him if he could take him to safety. And the man says, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go with you because I prayed to God and he's going to deliver me from this great flood. Time goes on, the waters continue to rise, maybe much like 37. And he's up on his roof now and the waters are nearly to his ankles. And a helicopter drops a ladder down with a loudspeaker they yell out to the man and says, please climb the ladder and come to safety because we want to get you away from this. You're the last man standing in this town. And he says, no, I'm not going to go with you because I prayed to God and he's going to save me. Shortly thereafter, he drowns. He goes to heaven. It's a better story than that. He goes to heaven and he goes before our Lord and says, why didn't you save me? Lord, I prayed to you. Why didn't you hear me? Why didn't you listen to me? Why didn't you send me help? And the, man res and the Lord responds. He says, you know, I sent you a car. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. Why didn't you take one of those lifelines? God knew his present situation. God knew his needs, and he refused to help. God has sent us a lifeline. God has sent us a helpmate. God has sent us one who is there for us at any moment to deliver us from our floods of life, our struggles that we have. And may not, may not pluck us up out of that, but offers us some ways out that we must look to. It's not always as simple as that, but it's always there. We can go to him through prayer. Teresa asked me again, we were talking about this week as she's preparing for Bible study and her Bible Sunday school class this morning, and we both took the Experiencing God Blackaby course uh, a few years ago, several years ago. In fact, it had been about 20 years ago now, and it had an effect on me standing before you right now. But it, in that particular series, Blackaby, Blackaby points out so um, concretely that how God comes to speak to us, he comes to speak to us through his word comes to speak to us through prayer, comes to speak to us through the church and through one another, through believers. There's so many ways that God ministers to each and every one of us. Corey Black, he was a good Baptist minister too, so uh, there was your Baptist moment this morning. I often give Wesley moments, but we'll give kudos to him. Uh, so we, we have a loving God who comes to us at all times, and he does know that we have problems, or we have issues, or we have those, those moments in our life where we scratch our head and say, what's going on? 
God knows. I hate to even admit it because for me, I make it easier all the time. There's one verse in Scripture that says He even knows how many hairs we have on our head. He knows that much about us. Yet we try to hide from Him. We try to run away. We try for our own personal escape plans until we finally come to a point where it's not working anymore. We fall to our knees and say, Lord, come to me. Let's look at how a God who knows all about us, a powerful God, an omnipotent God, the omniscient God, the all-knowing God, and the omnipresent God, the all-present God, is where this series will take us as we go through it. And this one, I showed you this slide last week, the omniscient God knows our situation. He definitely knows our sin life, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He saved us while we were yet sinners, folks. Didn't wait for us to clean our act up. He says, here, I want to offer you grace and a place with me. Forgiveness. He knows our struggles. He knows those health issues that we're having right now or those personal concerns that we maybe don't even want to share with those closest to us. Those problems that we face day to day. In fact, Matthew 6, 8, the, the great Sermon on the Mount, <laughs> Very simply, he knows exactly, exactly our needs before we even ask him. Can you look at God that way? Can you look at him as that personal that he can see right through you, so to speak? As we think of an omniscient God. God knows. Psalm 139 is where we're headed. God knows us completely as it goes in the psalm. And let's, let's pray before we begin. Lord, we thank you for your word the richness of it, the fullness of it, and the appropriateness of us. It's right for us in our lives. And Psalm 139 is especially uh, personal for all of us. Lord, let, let this psalm just ring through our very souls this morning, I pray. Amen. So 139 begins to tell us a, a story about who God is in the midst of our personal struggles. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. And known me. You've known me. Search means to examine in this, in this case. With some pain and with some care. It's digging deep. The Jewish people use this word to describe like digging into a mine. Or exploring something. Exploring, for instance, going out to a land. Or investigating in a legal case. You know, digging deep. Searching with all effort to, to find what is needed and Lord searches our hearts. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. That's, that's pretty personal, isn't it? Because we sit down and rise up quite a bit. You even understand my thoughts from afar. You know, people see what's going on on the outside of us. And they can sometimes see a look on our face or a, a fear maybe that we have going on about some particular thing or distress or a, a struggle. They also see our, our joys and our happiness and, and those things. You've probably seen that on Teresa and I's face the last few weeks as we've had um, our family home with us. Because it, but with that, the good, the bad, the ugly, the, the, the nice, God knows all of that. He knows each and every moment. He knows what's going on on the inside of us. And we can't hide it. Adam and Eve tried to hide it, didn't they? When they sinned against God. Sin is a grievous thing against God. God knows that. Specifically, that's the first example of God fully knowing that. They went and tried to hide from God. And he sought them out. And that's First question, I believe, is, is from that point in the Bible. After their sin, God didn't leave them, didn't leave them there. He went to, there, to them and said, where are you? Seeking them out, offering them his hand. Cain couldn't hide whenever his sacrifice was held back. And then he murdered Abel. He couldn't hide from God when that took place. Um, David couldn't hide in his sin with Bathsheba. It caught up to him. All of our sins, all of our struggle will catch up to us sooner or later. And God understands that. He understands our thoughts from afar. And even searches out our path, 
are lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. He knows each and everything that's going on in our life. I, I like this verse from um, Hebrews 4.13. This is from the New Living Translation. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And He is the one to whom we are accountable. Actually, those last few words shouldn't have even been put in small print. He is the one to whom we are accountable. Because all is exposed before him. There's a, <laughs> the picture, though, you might like. There's a few skeletons in your closet. <laughs> I like that. That's why I showed this. Well, I think we all keep a, we try to keep a few locked up, don't we? But if an, an omniscient God knows that they're in there, he knows that we've got some in there that we've tried to keep that door nailed shut on, he just wants to bring them out and say, you know, let's get through that. I forgive you for those. I, I want to restore you to the joy of your youth. We move on to the psalm in verses 4 to 6. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it. And probably a few of us, we wish he would tie that tongue, don't we? <laughs> before those words come out. <laughs> because sometimes those words can get... Messed up a bit. It can be the wrong words. They can uh, uh, defile a lot, of, a lot of things going on. Uh, verse 5 says, You hem me in, and behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I, can't, I cannot even attain it. And I decided I'd read this to you now, these verse 6 verses in uh, the message. So I love the, the, the way they flowed through the message says, God, would you investigate my life? Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Isn't that plain and simple? You know right what's going on with me every moment. I'm an open book to you, even from a distance. You know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave, when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there. Then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much. It's in fact too wonderful. I can't even take it all in. What a praise. You know, the, the psalmist here is not, is not saying, God, I don't like this intrusion. I, I don't like the fact that, that uh, you're there every moment and, you know, butting in on my time and my space and my fun. No, he's not saying that at all. He's saying, I, I relish that. I, I cherish that. I long for that. I want that. I need that. And I think it, they admit that would be the great admitting fact that we need that. We need that. That he wants us to know him that intimately and that personally that, that we desire that kind of presence in our life. It's wonderful. I can't take it all in. And I have to admit, it, it, uh, you know, if you think about your life or I think about my life, there are places that I've been, things that I've done that, that uh, I know are displeasing to God. And I, but I know that He knows those places. Those are the, those very moments that, Lord, would you please... Please forgive me for those. Forgive me that sin. But here's the end of the matter. If we don't ask God for that, if we don't ask for that presence, we don't acknowledge that in our life, the end of the matter is found in Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God's going to bring all those things into judgment. Every secret thing. Some are good, some are bad. He's going to bring them all into the light. And I think we have a good idea what they are. There's so many in today's world that don't want to acknowledge God in this way. God is intrusive. God is, is there to punish me. Or there's no God at all. Psalm 141 verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. But they are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. 
Verse 2 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who now seek God. And I have to think that's in some ways going on today. God is looking down. Are any seeking God? Remember back at the, the time of the great flood, that was what was going on. God looked down and saw no one was righteous, not one. Fortunately for us and for all of humankind, there stood Noah. And he used Noah to, to uh, cleanse the earth and hopefully set things back on the right track. But we know where that's led to this point. So, what does God know to sum all this up? God knows what we do. He knows when I sit and I rise as I summarize Psalm 139, verse 6 verses. God knows what we think. So, Lord, discern my thoughts. I can't figure it out. Would you discern my thoughts with me and for me? God knows where we go. Search my path, my line, and, and are acquainted with all of my line down, acquainted with all my ways. You know where I go. Verse 4, God knows what we say. And sometimes, Lord, stop this tongue of mine from saying the things that it says. Verse 5, God knows what we need. A lot of good advice, good help, good reminders of an all-knowing God, of an omniscient God in each one of these ways. And again from Psalms 139, as we move a little forward into this beautiful psalm, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great, great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. God thinks about you and I. You are the one on his heart, mind, and soul. This morning. And he will never let you stumble, slip, or fall. For he is always watching, never sleeping. He doesn't take a break. He doesn't take a nap. He doesn't check out on us as we check out so often. He's always there. Isn't that comforting? In the midst of life that you have one that's always going to be there for you. And he is a sovereign, powerful, knowing, present God in all things. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know all these issues, anxieties that I have. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in a way that is everlasting. That's kind of like that, that spiritual checkup. Look under the hood. You know, is my oil low? Or my tires need inflating? Is my, you know, am I running a little hot or a little cold? What's going on under the hood? Know my anxieties. Check and see if there's anything in me that needs to be brought into the light. Lord, that I might change, that I might be forgiven of, that I might get through, get over, be helped with in any possible way. And he searches us completely. And sometimes God doesn't change your situation in that. Sometimes after doing all that, he won't change your situation, but he might be trying to change your heart first to help you through that, to point you in the right direction. So, this morning as I close this, par this portion of this series, have you asked God for a tune-up, a change? comes to repentance. We're nearing the time of, of uh, Lent, just a month away now, and, and Lent begins on Ash Wednesday with Reflection and repentance. It's a great time to ready yourself for Lent. As begin to ask God to change your heart, to examine those areas. Use Psalm 139 for that. Recommend it. Search me. Even those dark secrets and deeds, expose them to the light. Test me. It can be risky to ask this. It really can. It can be risky to test me. Have you ever asked God to test you? Have you ever asked that? We, um, we had a um, lady at a church that I was at, uh, first church I served. And she, uh, um, very sincere, very devout lady. And um, she thought, she said that in her own reflection and prayer life one day, she, she knew that she felt like she'd had a charmed life. Everything had gone perfect for her. Nothing had ever been wrong, and she asked God to, to test her in some way. It was a difficult prayer. Um, she was diagnosed not long after the breast cancer. Um, I, only God knows how all that takes place, and I'm not going to ask. But for her, that was, 
a test that she had to go through, that fire that she had to walk through. It, was a, it became a testimony for her because God brought her through that as well and led her through and with, with even stronger faith. It's a dangerous prayer to ask God to test you, isn't it? And that one's uh, evidence of that. But she never doubted her faith, never tr doubted her trust and her hope that she would overcome through Christ her Lord. Tell me then. This is one thing after, after you, you go to the um, repair shop with a car and this is where you, you go in there and you, you hand them your car and say, I, I've got, I've, you, know, I'm, you might give them that sound it's making. And you tell them, and then they go under the hood and check it out. And they come back, and that sound that, uh, that they heard is a whole lot more serious than you thought it was, and it comes down to bottom line, it's really serious. Um, you got to tell you the diagnosis, and you have to accept it. And then, the main thing after that, you have to decide if you're going to fix it, don't you? You're going to junk it, you're going to scrap it, or you're going to have it fixed. Usually, we want to have it fixed, don't we? Sometimes we might even want something brand new. God can make you new as well. He can, he can repair the old part or he can issue new life. If you, it both amounts to new life through him. But it all comes through forgiveness. Tell me. Give me that diagnosis. And help me then. Help me. I'm sure all of you have prayed that prayer to God. Help me. I can't do this one alone. I can't do this one anymore. I don't want to walk alone. Alone. You have an omniscient God. I hope you're thankful for an omniscient God who cares about you every moment. God told us this in the book of Jeremiah. I got plans for you. I got plans for each one of you. I have plans for you. I have, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Plans to give you hope and a future. As I uh, was with my dear friend Friday, who is dying of cancer, I, I, David told me he's looking forward to his future. What comes next? His life with our Lord. An omniscient God knows the place we're at, what's going on, where he'd even like to lead us. I hope, and this is the way, the way forward for us individually and as a church, to come before that God and let Him lead us into that pathway and give us a hope and a future. Bow with me. Lord God, we're thankful that you know every moment of our life. That you restore us. Forgive us of our sins. Lead us into new pathways, into the right pathways, and offer us hope in a future. And as David said, thank you, Jesus, for all that. That is great love. Amen.